Yeah, we're alive. It's very unceremonious, isn't it? It just kind of happens. There's no like fireworks or nothing That's fancy nice. happens. Um, all right, Eric. E O E O R I K, yeah, E O R I K, yeah. I think it's spelled um, it with a C, but it is with a K. I think I did. I actually texted someone telling them that you were coming on, and as I wrote E O R I K in my head, I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure I spelled that with a C when I put it on the YouTube. But I never went back and checked. Um, thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Um, this thanks has been a a long protracted. A drawn out uh, courtship trying to get you to come on. Um, your hair man pinned down. Um, where do you live? Mm, normally I live in Copenhagen. Okay. In Denmark. Yeah. But I've been living in the countryside for the past six months. Right. My where... girlfriend and I just had a baby. Uh, Excellent. Seven months ago. And we wanted to start out in the countryside. So we just rented a nice summer house close to the forest, the sea, few people, many animals. Um, whereabouts? Whereabouts? So you're still in Denmark, though. I'm still in Denmark. It's the Danish countryside. It's uh, approximately 40 kilometers north of Copenhagen. Right. So it's just simple and nice. Okay. So you're kind of ne- What's that country beside you there? Sweden? It's like Copenhagen, is it? Is that Sweden? Um, well, one of the neighboring countries to Denmark is Sweden. Another one is Germany. <laughs> um, so like you're up here somewhere? Like around there somewhere? Exactly. Okay. Ish. That's Sweden there, right? That's right. Over that side. Yeah, okay. Um, what's the weather like there now then? Is it still kind of wintry and cold and stuff, or is it getting it's, nice? Um, similar to... Similar to Ireland. Shit, then. It's not okay. too cold. It's just bleak. A bit yeah, dark, gray. A bit rainy. Great. My God, I had no idea Copenhagen was over there. I had no idea there was two bits to Denmark. Three bits. Is that a separate bit there as well? Yeah. Wow. Jeez, I literally thought Denmark was just like that peninsula, and that was it. I'm so uneducated. Yeah. Is that Den- That's not Denmark, too, is it? Over there? It, it is. What? It's called Banholm, the sunny island. Is that populated? Like, is there? Do people live there? It's populated, and uh, a lot of tourists go there in the summer. Okay. It's nice. Cool. It's quite a big distance away. How did they manage to nab that? <laughs> I don't know. God, it's very far away. Um, yeah, every day is a school day getting educated um so you live uh you live in Denmark and how's uh fatherhood how's that's your first child so how's that going first child um it's amazing my girlfriend and I really love it really enjoy it Mm, it's the first child but hopefully not the last okay I follow um you told me that you have two children already with a, a third one coming in a month yeah, but, uh, with a bit of luck, we're going to surpass you. Wow. Okay, that's the goal, at least. But one okay. at a time. Do you have Do you have a number in your head? Or are you like, I want five? Uh, no, just one at a time. And are you an only child, or have you got siblings? I have two sisters. Okay. Um, is that did that uh, you know spur your idea to have more than one child? The fact that you had siblings. No. <laughs> no, we just, I, um, you know, we didn't plan on my girlfriend being pregnant. It just happened. And then the pregnancy uh, and the birth went really well, really smooth, no complications at all. And uh, the baby is really nice. And I know that it's something that, like, presumably all parents think and say, but it's just a really nice baby super easy um brings us a lot of joy the baby is very similar to my girlfriend which is good okay yeah um yeah so because everything has been so smooth and enjoyable um we just want more we also think that it's good for a child not to be a lonely child it's probably good to have siblings yeah i remember when we had our first child i was kind of like 
kind of happy with one like she's great but it was it was a big adjustment and then when my wife made the same point as you of like ah, oh, but like if we have one child and she's on her own you know like at least if she has a sibling and I was like right okay fine so we had a second child um and then after we had two she said I thought we were done and she said oh maybe we could have a third and I was like well why like they both have each other now and then she said, yeah, but if one of them goes somewhere, then the other one will be on its own. I was like, but like that could always, you could have 10 kids and one kid could be left on their own. I was like, your logic is fl- starting to fall apart. Like there's holes in your logic now that it's just like, well, you just keep having kids so nobody's ever alone. But like, mm-hmm. yeah, it turns out that if there's a, if there's a tied vote in the house, I don't carry the swing vote. It's not my, um, I get vetoed pretty easily, but I don't carry the swing vote. But as I said, we're not... You know, we're not planning anything. We're just yeah. living our life and uh, doing nothing to prevent it. Has it? Ha, okay. Has it? Um, has it changed? Like how you approach um, your like your work and stuff. Like, is it more? Because obviously, you travel a lot for seminars and stuff. Like, you were in somewhere in Spain. Was it Lanzarote or somewhere like that for like a couple of weeks? Is that like arduous being away then? Do they come with you or are you like a guilt laden coach that's away from home? Mm. I did an elite training camp in Tenerife in January. Tenerife. That's the event that you're referring to. That was one week and I brought my girlfriend and uh, the baby with me and that worked really well. You know, when I was working, I was working. And when I wasn't working, I think it was fine for the athletes to get a little bit of a break. Yeah. And uh, I could spend time with uh, the family. So I think that worked well. And usually I travel almost every week to do a seminar or some kind of training camp, some kind of event. And, you know, that's fine. It's uh, like, firstly, I have to put food on the table. And I work so my girlfriend doesn't have to so she can commit to being a mother which is what she wants to do and i also love my work it's really important for me um to be able to focus on my career to build my business to develop uh, as a coach and you know when i'm traveling and coaching and working i got i miss my family and when i'm home i really enjoy my time with them and i think that's a good thing yeah do you find and, it hard to switch uh, off? Usually, like from usually, usually I travel Friday and Monday, and then I work um, sometimes a bit Friday and all Saturday, all Sunday. And then I'm like completely home Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And of course, some of Monday, some of Friday. And do you find it hard to switch off from coaching? Like, are you are you a coach who's constantly accessible from the athletes that you work with and stuff? Or are you like, I will contact you between nine and three or whatever no i'm kind of almost always online yeah yeah is it difficult is it difficult to switch off then and just be like all right i'm home and you know what i mean Mm. yeah i i don't think it's a problem uh it's just you know i don't you know when i'm traveling and i'm working i'm working hands-on in real life but in a sense, I'm always working. People can always get in touch with me. That's how I want it, and I enjoy it. Yeah. Um, I don't really think of it, you know, like I love what I do. So to some extent, it's not really work for me. It's just what I like to do. Yeah, I follow. Uh, fuck, I'm going to butcher this. Dagmara Kulis? Coolies. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Eric is a fantastic coach. We just had him over for a seminar this weekend. And then Roman says, Aloha. I remember the smart gentleman from behind the scenes, Sarah and BKG coach. Mustache. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we'll get to all that. Have you, is, is weightlifting always been your speciality? Like weight, like did you weightlift yourself when you were younger and then transferred into a coach or did you just develop an interest in it? Yeah, okay. I'm going to give you the long answer. (laughs) So I grew up in the Danish countryside, approximately 40 kilometers north of Copenhagen, not far from where we're living right now. And uh, I went to a small local school, which stopped at the seventh grade. 
And up until that point, I played tennis and I played handball and a little bit of soccer and um, a bit of swimming, just like a lot of different things. I was active, but I wasn't really hooked, really committed to anything. But then for the eighth grade, all the pupils from the small local school had to go to a much bigger school. And at that bigger school where we had to go for eighth and ninth grade, uh, there was a gymnasium. And attached to that gymnasium, there was a weightlifting club, like a real Olympic weightlifting club. Yeah. And every day on my way to school, I would pass by the club and they had like big windows and you could see the, the people training. And to me at that time, they were fucking jacked. Like they were huge and they were lifting massive weights. And I think I just had a, a healthy instinct. I was like, I think 15 years old and you know i wanted to train i wanted to get like big and strong and i signed up for some kind of uh like strength course where you would be able to go to the weightlifting club and just do physical training not, not olympic weightlifting just like physical training a few times per week and i was totally hooked and after six months of just doing you know normal physical training um you know bench press dips just basic stuff. I was asked by the local weightlifting coach if I wanted to try weightlifting, and I just, um, I said yes, and just. Why? Why in. did he ask you that? Was he like poaching, or did he see something in you? Uh, I think he saw that I was committed, like that I really wanted it. I was definitely not the most talented, um, but I was just like really hooked. As I told you, I had dabbled in a lot of different sports, but hadn't really committed to anything but i was really committed to uh let's say physical training yeah um so when, when you still, yeah yeah sorry go on i'm just gonna stop you so yeah the weightlifting coach got me started with weightlifting and i became completely obsessed with weightlifting and uh you know this particular weightlifting club was had a really good culture in the sense that they would frown upon people that were talented but not hard working and they would exalt people that work hard regardless of their innate talent and i i really wasn't that physically talented but i was really dedicated and i was really willing to work hard so when i started olympic weightlifting I went from nothing but the physical training I had been doing for the past six months to training five times a week with the team. Like right. never miss a session unless I was sick. So I just became completely obsessed with weightlifting. I totally loved it. But gradually I began to realize that like my real talent would be for coaching and not for being a weightlifter myself. And when I was 20, I had already moved to Copenhagen and I was training at another weightlifting club. And I got the opportunity to transition into coaching the youth team. And at like at this point in time, you know, weightlifting was a small niche sport, no opportunity whatsoever for making like a real living. It was just driven by passion. And CrossFit hadn't arrived on the scene yet. So it was just something I did because I loved it, both training, weightlifting, training in general, coaching. I was just really passionate about it, but I couldn't expect to make a living from it. So after a couple of years of training the youth team and having really good results with them, but also learning a lot as a coach, I decided to just stop coaching and go into university instead. But then after a few years of that, I decided to quit it. And then I had a period of time where I just didn't know what I, I wanted to do with my life. But then I was contacted by some people that had been members in the weightlifting club in Copenhagen. And they'd been doing kind of like functional training, like circle training, like proto CrossFit. And they had seen me coach the youth team and we were on friendly terms and they just remembered me coaching there. So they opened a CrossFit box as some of the first people opening up a CrossFit box in Copenhagen. And they contacted me and asked me if I wanted to come and coach them and the other coaches in Olympic weightlifting. 
and I just jumped on the opportunity and then it just grew from there. Um, so when you're 20, what, uh, what made you realize that is, was it your physical limitations made you think that I should focus on coaching or did you just get more enjoyment out of coaching than you did doing it yourself? If you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> I think I've always been quite objective and rational and I could see that I had to work really hard to get limited results. And a lot of my teammates would either get much better results with the same work, or they could manage quite good results with a minimum effort. At the same time, uh, they just weren't good coaches. You know, <laughs> coaching is completely different. Um, so I didn't have that much talent for weightlifting as such, but I think I had a lot of talent for coaching and an interest in coaching, which is of course very important. And I was very competitive. Like I really wanted to compete. Um, and being a weightlifter myself wasn't really a good avenue for me in terms of being successful at competing. But I thought that as a coach, um, I actually had the opportunity to get really good results. So do you, like when you're coaching then, is that like, are you scratching a competitive itch when you're sending an athlete that when you're like, oh, I worked with that person, I got them, I helped them get to the level that they're at, ergo that's success for me. You know, I'm much older now and my priorities are different. Back in the day, I was very competitive, which I think is not a bad thing. It just has to be channeled in a productive direction. But yeah, of course, um, what was so important for me those couple of years where I was training the youth team was that I just started with one person. Like there was another coach in the weightlifting club, like the head coach. and But he had his hands full and, you know, he appreciated that I really wanted to coach. And he gave me the opportunity to coach one youth lifter. And I took that guy well, he was quite young, so he wasn't really a guy. He was more like a boy, but like that teenager. I took him and I transformed him. And I think that's what coaching is essentially about. It's not about conveying knowledge as such. It's about transforming the person that you're working with. So I took my student and I transformed him into something better. And I was lucky because he had two brothers who was also interested in weightlifting. So I started working with um, the other brother and I started the transformation of him as well. And then I got the third brother and I began the transformation of him as well. And then there was a fourth student that I also uh, worked with who proved to be the best of the four. And uh, like I said, as I said, like the, the key lesson for me was that I took someone who had a good attitude and certainly also talent for weightlifting, but who was very inexperienced. And then I started learn learning that person weightlifting. I started the transformation from, you know, any given starting point to being a really technically sound weightlifter. When you started coaching CrossFit then and like getting involved with CrossFit, um, did you have to um, like park some of that uh, desire for perfection when it comes to weightlifting because like it i could see how it would be frustrating for someone who's like pure whose pure focus is technique and like the minutia of completing a lift and then you go and watch someone do like grace or isabel or something and you're like pulling your hair out being like no that's not the way it's supposed to be done like did you have to kind of separate your like the weightlifting coach and just accept that it's that that's not what it's about, that it's a, like a broad thing and not as specific. I, I think one of my advantages is that I realized quite early that Olympic weightlifting is one sport and CrossFit is another sport. And CrossFitters shouldn't become weightlifters. They should simply improve the barbell game as part of their overall CrossFit game. Yeah. So that really wasn't a problem for me in the beginning one of my problems was that i was perfectionistic in terms of technique but also impatient and developing my patience over time 
has uh, made me a much better coach. Um, you you and uh, John Singleton go way back, right? You guys like were together like 10, 10 years ago ish. Yeah, ish. Yeah, it was like kind of the uh, from what I gather, it was kind of was this sort of like the inception of the program before it became the program. It was like you and him. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you still talk to John? Sure. Okay. Um, just your your yeah. Maybe <laughs> maybe wonder if you're uh, still on good terms. Um, no, we are. He was in uh, he was in Copenhagen a few months back, and uh, we met up for dinner and a good long talk. That's cool. I kind of find it it would be difficult not to like John. Like he's kind of. I just. I don't really see how someone could be like, no, that guy's an asshole. <laughs> he just doesn't really have that in him. Um, with him then, how did that happen? Because I, I guess that's your sort of, for me anyway, on a timeline, maybe you can correct me, but for me on your timeline, that would be your move into elite competitive CrossFit, like when well, regionals sort of came about and stuff. Well, it, it, you know, it started a little bit before that. So, um, as I said, I started working with <coughs> the coaches at a CrossFit box and they really enjoyed it and they recommended it to the members at the CrossFit box. And that resulted in me being able to do more classes. So quickly, I was not just coaching the coaches, I was also coaching the more experienced members. But then after maybe like nine to 12 months, the owners of the CrossFit box decided that they didn't want to pursue CrossFit anymore. They just wanted to close the CrossFit box, open up a new place and focus on like long-term personal training. And that proved to be a blessing in disguise because it forced me to find another place to set up shop. And I got the opportunity to run my classes in CrossFit Copenhagen, which is now called ARCA. And now, and especially back then, it was huge. It was like it was really big. It was um, back then. I think they had like ten boxes and maybe ten thousand members and a hundred coaches. So I started coaching and I got mass exposure, being able to work with most of the coaches, most of the experienced athletes, and also just like the broad masses of people. And back then, I didn't travel that much. Like I didn't do seminars and training camps. It took me many years to develop the event format which i'm using now back then i just did small classes of four to five people and i did 10 15 classes per week but in the beginning of 2012 frederick egidius the boyfriend of annie mm. from Iceland, who is also danish he reached out to me and asked me if he uh, could come and do some classes with me and if I could do some personal training with him and uh, help him with his weightlifting leading up to the regionals, which is what semifinals was called back then and which back then in 2012 was held in uh, a bit outside of Copenhagen. So I started working with him and he really enjoyed it and he benefited from it and that showed at the regionals where he did really well in the snatch ladder. And he told Annie, and Annie asked me if uh, I wanted to hook up and do some sessions with her while she was in Copenhagen with Frederick. And we did so. She also really enjoyed it. And she invited me to come to Iceland and do some classes in her CrossFit box, box uh, CrossFit Akavik. And uh, I just jumped on the opportunity, you know, really wanted to go to Iceland, really wanted to, you know, do classes abroad. And in the first class that I did, like, no kidding, like the very first class that I did, uh, Bjarkvin, BKG, <laughs> attended. Just like as a normal participant, you know, he paid for his spot and everything. And I was really, really impressed. Back then, he had only done CrossFit for about six months, which was really hard to believe, but he was just amazing. Like, to me, it was completely obvious that uh, this was really a diamond in the rough, someone with really exceptional potential. So when uh, the class was over, I asked him if he wanted to come back later the same week um, and do a session with me, just me and him. And uh, he agreed to do that. He came back. 
we did a session together, power snatches. I still have the video. It's like all green video. And uh, afterwards, he wanted to pay me. And I told him that, no, no, you don't have to pay me. I'm just going to help you get as far as you can. And uh, then I started working with Bjergvin. Of course, I still still did everything I could to help uh, Frederick and Annie. And, um, you know, Bjergvin ended up doing really well. So that opened up a lot of doors for me um, in terms of working with other elite athletes in terms of traveling more and doing classes and eventually training camps and seminars abroad. And one of the training camps I did was in Mallorca at CrossFit Mallorca, Rob Martin's box. And um, Rob just told me that, uh, you know, one of the guys from the gym would pick me up at the airport and then uh, I could stay with him and, I thought, you know, that sounds fine. It was Singleton. Like Singleton picked me up at the airport. I stayed uh, with him in his flat. He did the training camp uh, with Rob and Axel and all the other guys. He really enjoyed it. And we really got along. Like we just became instant friends. And he was like an osteopath and a CrossFit coach. And like me, like really hungry, really ambitious, really wanted to compete as a coach. And since we got along and um, complemented each other well in our different abilities, um, I decided to invite him to one of my infamous elite training camps in Iceland. And this is, this is, like the end of 2014 maybe the beginning of 2015 something like that so he came where you know to one of these elite training camps in iceland in which i invited like all the best athletes that i had met on my travels people like yeah Björkvin because it was in his box and uh you know stephen Fawcett, phil hersketh um my students from Denmark, Mike Bjergo, Andre Hode, Philip Tumbisko, Ben Messi, uh, Robert Mainlove, like all those guys. Um, and then we had a, a year, 2015, where we just went all in, Singleton and I, and we did some really cool training camps and we got some really good results. Um, Sarah was on board that year. That's the, that's the quick version. Um, <clears throat> what is there? Did I hear a story before that while you were working with John, that you were like forcibly removed from regionals in Europe or something? Was that 2015, 2016, somewhere around there? Yeah, that's in 2016. Um, hmm. You're bringing up all the good topics. Okay, like so, you know. Okay, the the short version is that who like, who I, I, who asked you uh, to I'll, leave? I'll, an, I'll answer because you know I don't have anything to hide. You know, I'll answer the question. It's it's really very simple. You know, back then, um, I felt that the coat. Sorry, I felt that the judging in competition was atrocious, and I still think that the judging in competition is atrocious, and. Uh, I gave expression to my belief in a very direct and very harsh way. To and, who? Well, just I had a, a Facebook group back then. I don't use it anymore. But back then I had a, I had a Facebook group. And, uh, you know, sometimes I would go on rants. And uh, <laughs> I remember writing a post about how bad I thought that the judging was. While um, you were there. No, no, no. It was no, no. It was uh, you know before, maybe two weeks before, four months, four weeks before. It was oh, you know, okay. like before the competition. It was just it was before the competition, but you know the regionals had already kicked off. Just okay, not, yeah, yeah. Not, just not the the European one, and uh, yeah, I just you know wrote a very critical post about the judging, um, and some of the higher ups read it, and uh, they didn't like the tone understandably so i got banned yeah tone is still an issue nowadays i think um mm -hmm. for some of the higher ups um so you you had a facebook group and you put does that mean that someone screenshotted in the group and sent it to someone then yeah but you know it, presumably yeah. um but 
like I do understand it. Of course, you know, I back then I thought that the judging was very bad. I still think that the judging is very bad. I think that all elite athletes will agree to that, at least hmm, secretly. Um, but of course, that concern, that opinion has to be voiced in a certain way. Otherwise, you're just going to get into trouble. And back then, I didn't appreciate that. Now I do. So hopefully, I won't get banned again for saying it. <laughs> who um, who asked you to leave? Did someone specific ask you to leave, or were you just refused entry? I just, you know, the regional director. Okay. And were you like pissed off? Were you just like, yeah, fair enough? Or were you like, this is worse than the fucking judging? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I, I was very disappointed. I was very disappointed, but, uh, you know, it was a good learning lesson. Yeah. Um, someone said earlier on, uh, oh, where the fuck is it? Oh, yeah. Eric is a wealth of knowledge. I've been stalking your Instagram for a while and it's so good. I'm the same. So I I can't remember wh why or how, but your Instagram like popped up. I don't know, was it in my search thing or did someone share something on a story or whatever? And I was like, who's this? And actually, it might've been Paul Warrior maybe or someone like that shared That's something. Awesome. Yeah, and I was like, who the fuck is Weightlifting 101? I remember thinking at the time, like, that's a fucking arrogant username to call yourself Weightlifting 101. That's like, especially in this realm, requires a level of confidence. And I was like, is this confidence like well-placed or misplaced? And I remember clicking in and you had a guy, I can't remember his name, but he was kind of like blonde, gingery, had a mustache, um, never, he either always wore either no t-shirt or a baggy oversized white t-shirt, one or the other. Um, right. And he was it, like, your whole profile almost was just this one guy, like mm. every story, every post, whatever. And I was like, who the fuck is this guy? Because it was no, it was like a nameless account, basically, because it was all just this guy. And I was like, I know that's not the person that he's talking about. Um, and that continued for a year, maybe 18 months. And then from my memory, unless, e either the algorithm fucked me up or your page basically just went quiet for like a prolonged period of time or, or became less noticeable for a prolonged period of time. And now in the last five months, mm. you're everywhere. So I'm curious, did you fall out of favor? Did you fall out of love with like coaching or with CrossFit or, and have you fallen back into it or what's like, what's the time like there timeline like there of like dipping away and then coming back? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so the guy that you're referring to is uh, called Thomas, and we spent a lot of time together. Um, and I helped him, well, like develop his bubble game, and uh, he benefited a, lo a lot from it, and I benefited a lot from it. As I told you previously, you know, like I really enjoy taking people and transforming them, like transforming their bubble game. And uh, I did that with him and I really enjoyed it and learned so much from it. But COVID hit with the lockdowns and everything. And my lifestyle back then was very, very much bound up with traveling and coaching and running my events, mostly abroad. Right? I was working a lot. I was traveling, traveling a lot. And almost all of my events were based abroad. And when I was back in Copenhagen, I really didn't really want to work. You know, I just wanted to like ch train and chill and yeah, maybe coach a bit. But then it was like friends like Thomas that I would help with weightlifting. I wouldn't like run events at such. Yeah. Um, and, you know, with the lockdown, everything changed all of a sudden very drastically. Um, I couldn't travel, I couldn't really work, I didn't really know what to do. So I decided to, you know, make a lot of changes in my life. I decided to pull the plug on a lot of people. I decided to restructure my business. I decided that, you know, I was kind of a bit tired of CrossFit and weightlifting and needed a bit of a break. So I just wanted to, you know, buy some dumbbells and just go down in a park and just destroy myself with a dumbbell and some burpees. And just keep things really simple. And uh, after the first lockdown, when things started to open up, I was kind of in doubt about what to do. Like, should I go back to traveling and coaching weightlifting and everything? And then when the second lockdown hit, I was like, fuck this. You know, for now, 
I'm just going to forget about CrossFit, forget about weightlifting, and I'm just going to commit to outdoor training because it's what I want to do with my own training. And, you know, I want to keep coaching and I want to like build an outdoor training group. I want to be like busy with a good project while this lockdown lasts, because, you know, back then nobody could tell, you know, yeah. is it three months, is it three years? And I didn't just, you know, want to sit in a couch and wait for things to open up so I could start traveling again. I wanted to be busy with something solid, like a project that I thought was worthwhile. So just did a lot of outdoor training myself, you know, just uh, like dumbbells and uh, burpees and running, just like super simple, super basic, but also really hard because it was simple and hard training. And it was outdoor training in Copenhagen all year round. And Copenhagen or Denmark, just like Ireland in January, is challenging if you want to do Shit. outdoor training. <laughs> yeah. Um, and like one of my principles is I don't work with people that don't want to work with themselves. Like, you know, I don't I don't want to motivate people. You know, I want to help them get better, but they need to, you know, have they need some sort of intrinsic motivation. And with the outdoor training, I mean, if you're willing to do outdoor training in Denmark all year round, I can respect that, you know, then you have a level of intrinsic motivation that I can respect and work with. Yeah. So, yeah, I just, um, I did all that outdoor training. I really enjoyed it. Um, but since it didn't have anything to do with crossfit or weightlifting, I kind of fell off the radar and also didn't follow the sport or anything. Uh, I was just in, let's say, my own bubble, a different bubble for a period of time. But it was a very, very good chapter for me. It, uh, I really developed as a coach. And it was also where I met my girlfriend. She was one of the um, first members of my outdoor training group. And we spent a lot of time together during the lockdowns, um, training together, just uh, enjoying each other's company outside of training as well. And it was the day she told me that she was pregnant that I decided to pull the plug on outdoor training and start to rebuild weightlifting 101. Because three things. Um, the first thing is that with outdoor training, I was bound to Copenhagen. I had around 20 classes per week, and I had to do most of those classes, if not all of them. And my country, uh, sorry, my girlfriend, she like she loves the countryside. She loves nature. She loves animals. Like, her motto is, um, yeah, nature over cities and animals over people. So, um, like, I didn't want us to be bound to Copenhagen by continuing with the outdoor training. That's one thing. The other thing was that um, when she told me I was pregnant, I knew that, okay, now I have to start making serious money because I have to take care of my family. Um, I'm a bit of a hobo myself. Like I could easily live like a bum. It doesn't really matter so much to me. I'm not very materialistic. So like I can live like a hobo, but I don't want my family to live like hobos. Yeah. Um, and then the third thing is that like I, I had been, I, I had had the feeling for some time that I couldn't develop more as a coach with the outdoor training, that it had been a really good chapter. I was able to develop as a coach, but that I really needed to get back to weightlifting on one and had an, have an opportunity to work with really good athletes again. Um, in order to apply everything that I had learned with the outdoor training and in order to continue developing as a coach. I guess it's probably, uh, maybe not necessarily easier, but that, you know, you're almost guaranteed that intrinsic motivation. If you're working with the top, the tip of the spear, like you're not, you're not going to have someone there that's like, I want to get better, but I'm not willing to do the work because they're already at a certain level. So of just general physical preparedness. That's true. Yeah, you don't get to that level unless you're motivated. Yeah. Um, when so you, like say that thing in January. So you've had the people I've seen you work with say <clears throat> are like uh, the training plan athletes. I've seen you work with like Heinrich, Jana, Reggie. Um, I've seen you work with uh, JST athletes like 
Jen. Um, I'm trying to think who else I've seen you work with. Uh, Victor Hoffer, like HWPO. Um, yeah. Is it, is, it, is it like Colin Bostard as well? He's going to be fucking huge, I think. Um, is it a case of you see someone and say, hey, I can help you, or people see you work with someone else and say, hey, can you help me? Or do coaches like say, does Steve Fawcett, because he used to work with you, see you ramping back up and be like, hey, Victor, you need to get in touch with this guy? Okay, yeah. Like, I have a very simple strategy. I work with the elite for free, and then the broad masses of people have to pay. And I think that's fair. Um, if an elite athlete doesn't want to work with me, that's fine. Um, if someone who's not an elite athlete thinks it's unfair that they have to pay and the elite doesn't, you know, that's also fine. The person can just become elite and then that person <laughs> doesn't have to pay anymore. And my definition of elite is that you have to call you have to qualify for semifinals as an individual. Okay. Right? If, if you qualify for sem for semifinals as an individual, you know, then uh, then you're elite. And you know, I do make certain exceptions. Um now let's take Lucy McGonagall from Ireland, or is it Northern Ireland? Ireland. We'll claim her. Ireland. Okay, okay. I don't want to get it wrong. Um, now, okay, she, you know, she did qualify for semifinals last year, and hopefully she will again this year. But even if she didn't, she's a games athlete as a teen, yeah. right? So she still qualifies as elite in my mind. So it's um, like a general guideline, but I do make exceptions when it makes sense. So I work with the lead for free and then the broad masses of people have to pay because I have to put food on the table and support my family. Now, the way that I work with the elite is uh, three ways. One, I have my events, which they can attend for free, seminars, training camps, and elite training camps. And then I also offer video analysis. So if someone sends me a video and asks me for technical feedback, I'll provide technical feedback. And then there is programming. Now, of course, all the elite athletes are following a program. Most of them have um, like a personal coach. So I don't really provide a full program, but sometimes a person needs some kind of technical drill to improve a given lift. And then I'll provide them with that, which is something very specific and something which can be easily integrated into their existing program without it ruining anything is that like say yes. you put up the other day about that yano was i think it was yano was jumping so you gave him no feet snatches or something and that was just you saying anytime you got snatches don't, don't move your feet basically yeah, so then he can just do it with his program yeah so you know take victor hoffer um from france who is a part of hard work pays off and who has Stephen Fawcett as his coach. I think Victor is a good technician, but he's not a great technician. But he needs to become a great technician. He agrees, and Stephen agrees, and they believe that I can help him make that transformation, make that transition from good to great. And that's really what I want to do. Um, it doesn't matter who I'm working with. Um, like I'm open to working with anyone who wants to work with me in good faith. The only thing I require is just a good attitude. And then regardless of the starting point, I'll help that person improve with a strong emphasis on technique. Do you ever get pushback from coaches? Like obviously Steve knows you, Yami knows you. Um, but do you ever get pushback from other coaches or have athletes ever reported it where they'll say like, oh, I'm going to do this like elite training camp with Eric. And they're like, no, fuck off. Like I'm your coach and you know, whatever. Obviously it's a closed minded attitude, but I'm just curious if people get territorial with that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, not these days because, you know, like one of the mistakes I made back in the day, um, like in the singleton days was that I tried to compete as a CrossFit coach, even though I wasn't a CrossFit coach. Now that lesson has been learned. And what I'm doing now is I try to work with everyone, like all the athletes and all the coaches. So I have a really good relationship with uh, Andre from the shortcuts. I have a good relationship with um, Stephen from 
hard work pays off, formerly GST. I have a good relationship with Jack from uh, GST, with Yami from the training plan, with uh, Philip from Apex Athletics. Oh, yeah. And uh, like I try to have a good constructive relationship with all the coaches and all the athletes. And like, honestly, I think all these coaches know that if I just stay in my lane, which is technical weightlifting, if I just stay within my lane, I can do a really good job. Like, and all these coaches and all these elite athletes are very much interested in improving their bubble game wherever they can. So if I just stay within my lane and I focus on helping athletes become better in terms of technique and movement efficiency and so on, everybody's happy. It's like your Instagram page is like a who's who, especially like Europe of like European CrossFit. Like that's so like founder of Rad, <laughs> yeah. uh, BKG, like founded and like grew HVPO and then or uh, JST and then moved and is like in charge of HWPO. Like are these? Uh, Is it is your is your page like a deliberate um advertisement window basically like a shop window of like look at these I helped all these I help him I have hey you know this guy I've helped him like games athlete I've helped him like is that the cuz like there's there's two when I look at your Instagram and like I kind of follow it with a keen eye enjoy following it and there's two there's a few different things that pop up. So like <clears throat> for me, one, it's a really good advertisement for you when you have a training camp. Like it's a no brainer that the elite athletes do it for free because now you're advertising your services to all of their following or anyone. If they ever improve or if they ever look better, it's like, oh, well, that's because, you know, that camp that I saw them on. Um, But then I'm also curious, like, you know, that... <clears throat> intrinsic motivation that you talk about and that the elites have like i feel like if i spent 30 seconds with you dissecting my lifting that this is what i would look like <laughs> i just have so much like you're you're very to the point and very like uh you know you don't pull any punches and you don't mince your words and you don't put in any fluff language like you're critical like publicly critical of people's lifting in a um what would you call it? Constructive criticism type way. You're not just saying like, this guy lives like shit, but you're, you know, uh, he moves his feet and he shouldn't move his feet and that kind of stuff. Um, mm. Do you, have you had athletes that you've worked with? I know I'm going to ramble now, but this just popped in when I saw Heinrich. Um, do you have athletes that you've worked with who, who have said like, you know what, Eric, go fuck yourself. <laughs> like I'm going to go with someone who does mince their words and who is a bit kinder. Uh, um, like imagine that you have an elite athlete and you go on and on and on about how that elite athlete was eight or ten years ago you know and uh, like an athlete is supposed to develop and supposed to constantly become a better version of himself or herself and so should a coach so i think in the past i was very much my way or the highway i was very unfiltered and a lot of people like that because it's entertaining but i was also able to produce good results now i'm think now i think that i'm able to produce really good results without being needlessly harsh or needlessly insulting um and it's you know it has nothing to do with me becoming a father or become like getting more soft it's just my coaching is better like my coaching is better because i'm better as a person yeah. and one of the things that I really benefited from in terms of the outdoor training that I did was like understanding my audience better, getting much, much better at sizing up the person or the group of people that I was working with and then adjusting myself to them and to then move them up from there. Does it make sense? Yeah. It does. Um, but say like this now, like, so when you have, you have a, Victor, a video of Victor mm. and like, 
when I read these captions, like I chuckle to myself when I read them because it's like there's nothing bad in the caption. Do you know what I mean? But to someone, to you, a conversation, say, between you and Victor, or you and Steve, this sentence probably, the three of you will probably read it and be like, yeah, like that's that's 100% accurate. But then me, who isn't an elite coach or who isn't an elite athlete striving to get better, looks at that and is like, oh, geez, like you could have worded that differently. Um, but then obviously when you click on to the second story, it's like, you know, you you elaborate on it. But just when you see that first one, and I'm also curious, like when I look at this, I'm like, geez, man, Victor's a good lifter. <laughs> when you look at it, you see like uncontrolled movement. Like when you came back from your uh, outdoor training, which you said was dumbbells and burpees and stuff and running and, you know, like kind of body weight stuff. Right. Did you have to retrain your eye? Because like what you're looking at, like I look at that and I think, fuck, Victor is strong. That's a good lift. You look and you obviously see like one wobble of the knee or like an elbow not doing what it's supposed to do. Like you're talking minutia in terms of 99% yeah, like, of coaches. Yeah, but listen, he wants to win the games. No, I understand that. But I just mean like being, a being able to spot it. Like, did you have yeah. to retrain your eye to be like, like, yeah, listen, okay, I'm gonna answer your questions. Like, but first, let me say that, like, Victor wants to win the games, or like, certainly he wants to go to the games, he wants to do really well at the games. One day, he wants to get on the podium, and I'm sure that he would like to be a champion one day because that's just the kind of person that he is. Um, just like Bjorkvin, just like Jonne, like in the heart, they want to win the games, like they want to be the best and they believe that they could become the best, otherwise they wouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, and when you have people that have proven themselves, who are at an elite level, then of course you have to hold them to a much, much higher standard. I agree that the lift that you just saw was a good lift, but it wasn't perfect, far from it. And that's the point. Now, um, about training my eye, no, I didn't have to retrain my eye, but um, like when I'm coaching a seminar, I take people, the group of participants through what I consider one very long, very extensive and detailed sequence. And it's just like a performance in a way. So, you know, I wasn't rusty as a coach in any way because I've been coaching more than ever with the outdoor training, but I was a little bit rusty coaching weightlifting. It wasn't my eye or anything. It was just the, you know, specific drills and the, um, the order of the drills and so on. And actually, you know, the reasons why, the re one of the reasons why I got back to weightlifting, I told you that, you know, I made the decision when my girlfriend told me that she was pregnant, but before she told me she was pregnant, she uh, had been punking me for not teaching her weightlifting. Um, as I told you, she was in the uh, outdoor training group and she was the best member. Um, she was really, really fit. Um, and she had reached a point with the outdoor training where it just, it didn't make, it didn't make sense for her to get better at running or better at burpees or better at single artness or better at throwing around a dumbbell. Like she needed something much more difficult in order to continue her athletic development. And it was just so obvious that she should do weightlifting. So I began coaching her weightlifting and then I kind of realized, okay, I've been missing this. Yeah. You know, like I've been missing the bubble. And, uh, I also started posting about it on Instagram. Um, posting lifts of her and a lot of people wrote me man it's so good to see that you're back coaching weightlifting like fuck your dumb bullshit you know it's so boring please come back doing seminars and training camps um so like the the, the seed was definitely planted before i made the final decision um just just comments um so ben says looking forward to having Looking forward to our seminar on Friday. We've got them all weekend in Kendall. That's in the UK, surely, is it? With a name like Welton and a place named like Kendall. Yeah, it's a few hours from Manchester. Um, Heidi's asking if I've ever tried pure carnivore. No. No. Nope. <laughs> um, Augusta says, Eric, just shut up and let me talk. Yeah, I heard that too. Um, were you in the Isle of Man? Did you do a seminar on the Isle of Man? I did. And did you enjoy it? I did very much so. That's cool. 
I have to go back. Um, shit, there was something that you said there. Um, fuck, I can't remember. Oh, do you prefer? So say like I'm not I'm not good at lifting. Like I'm not technically proficient, or uh, you know, don't have the prerequisite strength or mobility or athleticism or balance, agility, any of the skills required. Um, if uh, if you had a choice between, say, someone like me who has, we'll pretend I'm 10 years younger, so I have more potential. So someone who's raw, who hasn't done it, but wants to get better versus someone who's like at like, say, 98%, like just needs like m- minuscule little tweaks would you rather take someone who's like got obvious glaring faults that are like, oh, fucking hell. I mean, straight away, look at your back when in your like, you know, in the start of your lift, you need to do this, that, or the other, versus, oh, your little finger comes off the bar for a millisecond just as you're about to jerk. We need to fix that. Do you know, like, is it is the minutia what draws you in or do you like just improving a turd and turning it into like a diamond? Mm, I care more about the personality. Like, so, like, okay, I, I would prefer if people were not at a complete beginner stage. Um, but that's also because it's kind of holding the group back a bit. Remember that I very rarely do one-to-one coaching. It's yeah. almost always group-based. And if you have someone with a good attitude, but who is at a, let's say, low level, like a beginner stage, even if that person is doing his or her very best and even if i'm doing my very best that person is bound to hold back the group a bit so i would definitely prefer that it's a person um who has the basics down and that i can help just become even better uh, and who at the same time is um, increasing the level of the group but we should talk about you What's your one RM squat snatch? Oh fuck all. Um all time. All time. I I have a vague memory of doing like 70 kilos, but I'm not sure. Was it a power snatch into an overhead squat or was it really a squat snatch? Did you catch all, it? Like- no, I I think I uh I would say I caught it like on the way down. I didn't catch it at the bottom. I'd say I caught it like caught it. It wasn't a power, but it was like, could have been arguably a power, but I wrote it down. You know, I didn't like catch it and then slowly start a squat or like move my feet and start squatting. Um, yeah. And then clean and jerk. I think I did. I think I remember doing like 103 or something once, 104 or something random. Um, you know, I have a funny story. You could have let that silence go a bit longer if you really wanted to stick yeah. the knife in. <laughs> I, uh, I remember once asking Björkvin, BKG, how long it took for him to snatch 100. And he did so after six months of <laughs> CrossFit. And then I asked him, when did you clean and jerk 100? And then he had to think for a few seconds. And then he replied, it was always there. <laughs> good answer yeah but hey you should come to a seminar um hopefully i'll be doing a seminar in ireland or northern ireland this year and then you should come yeah but you know you're talking about that person who holds back the group <laughs> it's okay uh you'll make an exception so that's this that's yeah that's this weekend candle hmm. and then you're in germany it's pretty much every fucking weekend. You see, you you're even doing. Oh, that's that's Easter weekend, is it? That's Easter Sunday. Yeah, I don't care, man. Um, so Germany, Austria, France, Germany, 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 Finland. Elite training camp. So who's going to be at that one then? Um, Does that mean that I can't go? To, like, if I was in Finland and I was like, "Oh, Eric's coming to Finland," but then I can't go to that one unless I've qualified for semifinals. You would have to qualify for the games. Oh fuck! Okay, I see. So that's going so, to be like uh, Heinrich, yeah, as, as Heinrich, Yana. Yeah. So you know there are 
seminars and training camps and elite training camps and elite training camps are invitation only and the elite training camp in finland in june is a games preparation camp right so um it's going to be one week you know like imagine that you do the semifinals. you know the week after you're pretty sore you're pretty tired you're not going to do that much training but if you qualified for the games like at some point you have to make the mental switch like you have to get back to training like now it actually yeah. begins because you have to prepare for the games you could so, you could say uh, you could say you have to get back to the bar if you wanted to say you something <laughs> but, so you know that particular ID training camp is only going to be for games athletes um that need to switch on who are interested in really working technically on their bubble game like really taking their technique to the next level and combining it with a lot of non weightlifting training um and it's also going to be an opportunity for some of the coaches of the athletes to take part so that the coaches can work with their athletes in the non weightlifting uh, sessions oh okay i follow yeah so you know the program is still under construction but i'm sure it's going to be a really good training camp and uh, i'm talking a lot to the athletes that are presumed to take part they have to qualify for the games first of course but i'm talking to um some of them and you know getting their input so i know exactly what they would like what's the difference between i can figure out the difference between an elite training camp and a training camp but what's the difference between a training camp and a seminar is a seminar like you go in and take whoever's in a gym whoever wants to go through like a weightlifting workshop basically versus training camp is people who are looking to hone their skills basically yeah. okay so anyone within reason can attend a seminar like anyone who has two arms two legs who can count to 10 <laughs> is willing to listen and to work hard can come to a seminar if you do a seminar and you do it well and you're hungry for more then you can go to a training camp okay and then there are also elite training camps um in the next one you have to be a 2024 european games athletes uh, athlete in order to participate but there might be other elite training camps where exceptions will be made for certain semi-finalists it depends i did a, an elite training camp in tenerife uh in january and some of the participants were not games athletes but they were still invited yeah is that do you is it, like do you look for something specific in them or is it if you've heard of them or if you've seen them and been excited by how they move or that kind of thing yeah as you um yeah, take colin bushart or take Victor Hoffer, or take uh, Jennifer Moore from Scotland. You know, those three athletes are not games athletes yet, but I believe that they will become games athletes and I want to help them get there. I have, I think they're going to, the three names you've said there are going to be games athletes this year, I think. Right. They're my, three of my picks. Also, um, you know, sometimes, you know, say, you know, if Stephen Fawcett writes me and says, hi, Eric. I have a really promising young talent. Can this person come to one of your training camps? I'm not going to say no. Yeah. So sometimes coaches reach out to me because they feel that they have uh, an exceptional talent and they would like that person to come and work with me, but maybe also work with me in a context where they will meet the people that are at the level that they aspire to. You know, back in the day when I did the elite training camps in Iceland, I think one of the game changers for some of the young athletes, like, Mike Bergo, Philip Tumbisko, Andre Hude, who many people will know, is that they got to meet Björkven when he was a high-level games athlete, so they could see this is where you need to go. Like this is the level that you have to be at. I think oh, that was a very formative experience for them. Um, being able to, yeah, like you know, train with athletes like Björkven, Sarah, Steven, Phil Hesketh, and so on. Augustus PR'd his power snatch yesterday, 110. Wow, his full snatch is on minus 113 kilos. Oh my God, that's terrible, minus 113. Um, d didn't you say to me before that 
you, I don't know, was it you that said it or Emma McQuay that said it, that I'd never make it through a seminar? <laughs> um, I think it was Emma who said it. Bitch. I'll, I'll make sure that you make it through the seminar, but you have to show up. Um, when is that likely to be? I don't know. I'll let you know. Okay, I'll go. If it's not like when my baby is due, I'll go. Um, that would be interesting. Um, yeah, minus 113 kilos when you drop the bar on your head. That sounds accurate. Um, are you surprised by, it's funny when you name the list there, like Steve Fawcett, Andre Hude, Andre especially, Steve Fawcett, Andre Hude, BKG, Yana, like they're all sublime movers. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They're like technically, like Andre Hude is like, to me, to my eye, is like fucking hell. He moves so well. Like his lifts are just so nice to watch. Like his heaviest and his lightest always look the same. Um, so it's interesting for people who are watching or listening. Like, I think that says a lot that the list of names that you've worked with are a list of people who, if you watch them lift, you're like, wow, that's a good lifter. Like it's, it's that like, do you take pride in that? Like the historical, um, what would you call it? Like potency of your coaching or whatever, or the impact of your coaching on the names that you've worked with, like the, the fact that they're renowned for their lifts and stuff. Yeah, I'm happy about it, of course. But a few things. The first thing is that Andre, to use him as an example, wasn't born a good mover. He was born with the potential to become one. I, he also had to work really hard in order to become a very good technician. Um, like I have many old videos of Andre doing weightlifting, you know, videos that are six or eight or 10 years old where he had potential, but he wasn't a good technician yet. Yeah. It required a lot of coaching and it required a lot of hard work um, to get him to that point. That's the first thing. The other thing is that, you know, when people say that, well, if it's a light lift or heavy lift, it all looks the same. It's like, no, it doesn't. You know, he still makes mistakes and, you know, he should be called out for those mistakes. And I think that's one of the things that I do well as a coach. Like, I like I really like Andre. Like, I really like Björkvin and Jan and Victor. Like, I really like those guys and I have a lot of respect for them, but I don't put them on a pedestal. Like, I don't pretend that they're perfect. And uh, it's exactly because I see their mistakes and explain to them, that they are mistakes and how to correct them and why it's important that they do correct them, that I'm able to work with them. Yeah. Um, the other thing with the list of names that you mentioned is that they were all, uh, obviously some are, are, are like just starting out or, you know, like are in the midst of their journey or whatever. Some of them are retired. Some of them are still at their peak somehow after like fucking 30 years or whatever, BKG and Yana. Um, they are all very successful and have been very successful in the sport. Like the names that you've worked with, um, like Steve was first to do individual team and masters from the UK. Like he's built like coaching companies. Like he's obviously really good coach, but he was a really good athlete first. Um, Phil Heskett, one of the first in the UK to go to the games. Um, like Yana just, renowned for consistency bkg like they're all like strong names in the sport um do i'm curious like what you think about sarah and her say trajectory compared to those guys where she was on the cusp of like being one of the best to do it and there was like there was so much hype about her and so much there still is a lot of hype about her now but there was so much hype about her and it was like, oh, she like, I think maybe people expected her to do what T ended up doing of like just taking over that she was just going to be the next thing. And she was just going to do a froning on it and be around for a long time and stuff. And she kind of stuttered and stalled and there was injuries and she kind of changed training camps and moved and changed again and moved again and kind of never really reached. Some would argue never really reached her potential in the sport. And as someone that it worked with her early doors and then, you mentioned earlier on that you stopped focusing on the sport and that you kind of didn't pay attention to it for a while during the kind of 2020, 2022 kind of years. When you came back, are you like, is, did you expect her career to go to the way that, that it 
has gone? Did you expect her to be better? Do you think that she reached her potential? Do you think that she didn't? Do you think that she made mistakes or coaches made mistakes? Mm. Well, I think she, okay, she definitely didn't reach her potential. I think a lot of people, including herself, expected her to win the games at least once. Um, and I think that she had the potential to win the games. Now, if I could go back in time, I would have approached things very, very differently. Um, but I'm sure all coaches and all athletes can say that. Um, like, I wish I could go back in time with the knowledge and the maturity that I have now, because I could have done much, much better. Um, I think one of the reasons why I hold Bjorkman in such high regard is because of all the athletes I've known, I think he played his hand the best. You know, when Bjorkman started CrossFit, he was an incredible talent, really a prodigy, but he still had like a lot of problems that he had to overcome. He had um, old injuries that he carried into the sport. He was really, really lacking in uh, upper body flexibility. And he overcame it all. And I think in the final analysis, he played his hand extremely well. Um, I can't think of any athletes that have played their hand better than Bjorkvin. And, you know, that's why he's been able to be at the top level for a decade. Like, you know, be at the top level for a decade. That's easy to say, but it's very hard to do. Um, and I think that Sarah had the potential to do really great things. And of course, you know, she has done great things. I'm not going to deny that. I think she could have done even better, but she wasn't able to play her hand as good as Bjergman did. And, you know, there are many reasons for that. But I think that's uh, that's how I see it. Do you... Uh... Do you take, are you like, do you blame yourself for some of that? Just the way you said, I wish I could go back in time, I wish I would have handled it differently. Uh, no, like, I think I, I brought a lot of good things and some bad things. Just, there's the bad things like intensity or a uh, high, high expectation or something or. Um, no, I think, you know, one of the things that I really strive for now as a coach is to understand that like as a coach or you know as a person in any kind of relationship you can contribute with good and with bad and in the past i did a lot of good and a lot of bad whereas now i really try to only do good and eliminate everything that's bad and obviously i'm not always able to do that but i'm uh, keenly aware of it and i try very hard What's bad? Like, what's a glaring example of bad? Now, it doesn't even have to be a real example, but a hypothetical example of something bad you could do. Well, just, you know, being impatient and getting easily angry. Okay. Or um, if you get disappointed in an athlete, maybe showing it in an, in a way which isn't constructive. Okay, yeah. Arguing, like, instead of... Yeah, I get you. That's just age as well, though, right? And experience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, age, experience, maturity. Are you calmer now, or do you just bite your tongue more? Uh, well, I'm biting my tongue a bit. <laughs> um, now, of course, you know, I... I could go into more detail. Um, I don't mean and, now. I'm not. No, I don't mean now. But I mean like when you're coaching, in general. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So two things. You know, like I, I know a lot of elite athletes really well, and in order to help them effectively as a coach, um, like I try to really understand them and really talk to them. And there are certain things that I'll say on a podcast, but there are other things that I won't say because I think that it betrays uh, their trust in me. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Um, the 
the other thing about biting my tongue, it's um, like as a coach, to me, this is just my opinion. You know, it's not about what you know. It's not about what you say. It's not even about what you do. At the end of the day, a coach has to be judged on the performance of his or her athletes. Right. So everything I do, like the way I act, everything to me now is geared toward being effective and helping my students develop regardless of their level. So it's not that I'm uh, being dishonest. It's not that I'm, you know, afraid of uh, mm, being direct with people. I just try to work with people in a way that's actually constructive, which is actually effective, which actually makes them better. So I'm as soft or as hard as I need to be, depending on the situation. Okay, yeah, I follow. Um, I don't want to be. A, I don't want to be a controversial figure just to get attention. Um, I think it was like that in the past, at least to some extent, um, but. Um, yeah, I'm just done with that. Like, I just want to focus on my work and do my work well. Yeah. I think it's seasonal as well, like where you kind of, not you, but like, I think some people think that that's what you're supposed to do and then it works and then you keep doing it. And then eventually you just realize like, maybe there's a different way to approach people or maybe there's a different way to, to gain notoriety as in like what you're saying now of. If, the, if your athletes do really well, you're a really good coach versus if you're heard or seen on the sideline or, you know, like courtside or whatever, and your athlete's bombing and you're shouting at them, <laughs> like you'll probably be judged a bit differently than just quietly watching them succeed, I guess. Um, have, you, have you watched the documentary called Jiro Dreams of Sushi? No. You have to watch that documentary. It's a documentary about arguably the best sushi chef in the world and you know if you think that you work hard if you think that you pay attention to detail then think again um man like the the <laughs> like to be a renowned sushi chef in japan requires like unbelievable uh conscientiousness like unbelievable work oh, ethics. hang on i'm still here my uh yeah. camera overheated sorry okay no, but, um, you know, watching that documentary, watching similar documentaries just uh, has made me. There you go. Fantastic documentary. It really is. But, uh, yeah, watching that documentary in particular has um, made me focus much more on my craft. I just. That's really what I want now. I just want to develop my craft. If I think that if if I am really, really good at what I do, which is teaching people weightlifting from a technical perspective, then uh, all doors will open and all good things will come. That's cool. I respect it. Um, so if people want to find out more, they can go. Your website is really nice, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, they can go to my website. They can, they can go to Instagram. They can always just write me. Um, I like the fact that these kind of look like SD cards. I don't know why that appeals to me, but I just, it's a novelty that I like. Um, but it's a very smooth interface. I don't know that I'm getting kind of nerdy, but I just really like it. Um, and then you can go to your, uh, so weightlifting at weightlifting underscore 101. If you want to watch like, cool stories of people lifting if you want some nostalgia some trips down history lane if you want to see what the current open champion i think um is doing in his weightlifting or unofficial open champion um or if you want to see what steve fawcett looked like before he had wrinkles hey i have to add that i'm really impressed with stephen fawcett i don't understand how he gets all that work done like he's uh, he's able to juggle well, like three things. So it seems to me that uh, like, like he's in a good marriage and he's a good father yeah. and he's doing really great work with hard work pays off. And then at the same time, he's able to qualify for semifinals and games. 
Yeah, him qualifying for semifinals last year was fucking nuts. Like in the that was crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Um crazy. And then going as a masters, crazy. And coaching people when he's there, like working with Jake and the other like it's it's nuts. I don't know how he does it. And it, like I always find um maybe I'm hypercritical or something on myself, but when I see like say Ben from Rad like building his business, traveling all around the world, all that kind of stuff. And yeah. then lovely, happy family <laughs> at home. And then I see Steve do the same lovely, happy family. And he's like working weird hours because his like business and clients and shit are in America and all that. Um, yeah. And then I'm like arguing with my son because he insists on like pissing standing up instead of sitting down <laughs> i'm like what? like how are these guys juggling so much stuff like yeah it's crazy um they're crazy impressive but it's that intrinsic motivation that you talked about i think that went from when they're athletes just carries over to like what you're doing they just want to be elite coaches or, or elite business owners or elite like ben wants to have the best shoe and the best brand in the space steve wants to be best coach with the best coaching company in the space. Do you know, like it's that competitive yeah. nature, I guess. It's crazy. Yeah. Crazy. But you know, you have a lot of people that are competitive without being competent. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. So, <laughs> like a like a rudderless boat. I don't know where I was going with that. Um well listen, thanks Eric. Um keep me keep me posted on your Irish seminar and I'll uh I'll get out the WD forty. I'll limber up. I'll get. I'll grease my joints. <laughs> get, you have to come. Emma McQuaid yeah. and I will come and pick you up. Yeah. Um. Yeah. No, I will. If I can, I will. If it works child wise, I will. Um. But thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks everyone for watching as well in the comments and all that kind of stuff.